So basically, we started last class with this idea about market failures. And essentially, mar a market failure is a situation in which the market equilibrium ends up with a very inefficient result. And therefore, it, that result should be addressed with a policy response. And there are different policy responses that have different consequences on the market and on different agents from the market. And that's a little bit the idea about these last topics in the microeconomics section. So basically, we last class, we were discussing this idea uh, more into depth about what economic efficiency is. And the, and the idea that in terms of economics, efficiency is measured as getting the most value of things at the lowest possible social cost. And this, this is, is derived from an, an, a notion called Pareto efficiency. But the point here is that um, with Pareto efficiency, we can essentially understand that most economic equilibria that exist in real life are efficient situations as long as they are the result of the fr free and unrestricted dynamics of the market. And what I mean by that is that they are, those equilibria are the result of consumers going to buy the things they like to buy, depending on their preferences and their income and the prices they face, and that producers are able to enter into different markets, use certain technology processes to create different products, goods, and services, and with those uh, products, sell them at a, a specific a profit margin, make some money, and uh, compete with others, and as time goes by, new competitors will enter the market, new technology processes will change certain dynamics, and that evolution will have something that uh, a, a, a term coined by uh, Austrian economist uh, Joseph Schumpeter in the 1940s called creative destruction. And what it means is that the, the dynamics of the market give the condition such that new firms will arise, they will be new for basically new processes, they will create new markets, think of the, of the idea of the smartphone and how it did not exist 15 years ago. And, uh, and with those processes entering into into a real life, others will basically be destroyed and, and, and those firms will disappear. The streaming example and the blockbuster example, that type of thing. So that is something that the people that really believe in free markets understand as a natural process. However, there is also, we need to recognize that in real life, it's hard to actually have very competitive markets. We do have competitive markets, but we also have very non-competitive markets or, or, or markets that are not very competitive for different reasons. And those different reasons create a bunch of market inefficiencies and market failures that have consequences on real people, on their income, on their way of life, on the amount of opportunities they may have. And therefore, this allows others to take actions and based on that change things. As long as that happens, you will have more efficient results than not. And a little bit of this uh, relationship between Pareto efficiency and competitive markets is that a competitive market equilibrium, as the ones you saw at the beginning of this course when we were finding the, the equilibrium of demand and supply, uh, arises or is competitive because of two key idea, two key principles. Uh, and these key principles are the following. Um, first of all, that each consumer is choosing their most preferred affordable bundle. Everything we did before the first midterm, this idea of the optimization principle. As long as people are able to choose the their optimal uh, quantities of, of different goods, then you are you are basically moving towards a competitive equilibrium, a, an efficient equilibrium. And the other one is that the consumer's choices are consistent, allowing producers to satisfy those needs, clearing the markets. The equilibrium principle, in other words, basically tells you that people are more or less rational. And as producers of certain goods, you can understand the consumer dynamics and what their preferences are, what type of things they like, what they don't like. And based on that, you can do your own decisions on how much to produce, what type of products you need to produce or, or services to offer and the like. The combination of these two things in a more or less unrestricted manner should give us a basically efficient outcomes as long, and this is key, as long as we are within 
competitive markets. And that is the key that separates and differentiates a lot of these things. These notions allows us to understand two key, two very important concepts in, mic in microeconomics. Basically, this is what's called the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics. And the idea is that competitive market equilibriums will be efficient as long as these conditions hold. And that is key because in many markets in real life, this does not hold. One, that economic agents are price takers. We have discussed both in the consumer side of things and in the producer side of things, what economic, uh, what price takers or price taking means. In the consumer side of things, it means that you are only one out of potentially thousands or millions of consumers of a good. Therefore, your consumption decisions will be so small relative to the overall market that you will have no power to influence the price of a good. That happens more or less in almost any market in real life. Consumers tend to be really small. And the other side is that producers are small enough, that you have a lot of competitors in the same industry. And because you have a lot of competitors, if you decide to stop producing or you change the price of your own good, you will not affect the overall average price of the, of the, uh, of the market because you are so small that you are al almost negligible with regards to other competitors. This first point all, only holds if you have competitive markets. The moment you have markets which are much more oligopolistic or monopolistic, in which you only have a couple of big, big producers, this does not hold and therefore the competitive equilibrium potentially would not be efficient. And that is key because that is some of the things that uh, many people that are not really in favor of the free market um, object and essentially they argue that this never happens in real life. Uh, the second point is that there is perfect information and no transaction costs. This never happens in real life because there is no such thing as perfect information. No transaction costs we have also discussed with regards to producers and e-commerce and how e-commerce is re drastically reducing transaction costs because you basically click something on your iPhone or your tablet, your computer, and two days later or three days later, that package arrives at the, at the, at the door of, of your house and you don't have to do anything else. That's almost zero transaction cost. However, we don't have perfect information. Perfect information is this idea that we know all of the different places in which our product that we want to buy is being sold. We can basically see all the prices and compare and be rationally take all the information into account. I basically just uh, and evaluate or judge the quality of the goods and with all that information, make the best decision. This is really, really hard in real life. In the side of, of, of the, of the um, producers, the use of data science is allowing firms to much better understand their customers, the, the things they want, and they're also making real strides in, in, with regards to the access of information. However, beyond the ethics of that and beyond the, the, the other part regarding like how this, is, this information is obtained, it's certainly decreasing the, the complications of, uh, of getting this perfect information, but the point is that efficient equilibria arise from basically having people making their best decisions possible, and that implies having the best information available, which is hard in real life. And most so, of the time, this never happens. Then the, the last thing, which is like the one that has like the most complicated uh, notion, is this idea of local non-satiation of preferences. Or in other words, that there are many alternatives sufficiently close to the original consumption bundle that are preferred by people. Basically, this means that the local association of preferences is just a mathematical slash economic jargon to describe this idea that you, any, for any product you wish to buy, you can find sufficient alternatives to that product, whether they are different brands of the same type of product or other substitutes uh, that you could use in, in place of that good that are sufficiently close to where you are that you can go buy them and it's not like having to travel very, very far for them. And you can basically substitute from one input to another, from, a, in a, from a, another firm in the same region, that type of stuff, such that you can prefer them to the original consumption bundle. That is this idea of local non of preferences. 
there are many cases in which we don't find competitive equilibrium which are efficient and those are called market failures and they may be different situations that address basically the idea that economic agents do affect the price and the quantity available. One case may be mon monopolies and market power from, from specific big firms in, in certain industries, but others may be things that, that are basically things like asymmetric information, which means that certain people, because they have more income, more resources, more education, can make better decisions than people that don't have good information. That is an advantage and a little bit of an unfair advantage uh, that allows them to make better decisions and eventually could potentially become more successful in their economic transactions or better off because of those economic transactions. All of those are market failures that could be addressed by different policy interventions. Some of these things are illegal, some of them are legal. And a lot of them depends on the type of country, the type of laws you have, and the specific situation. But basically, they constitute situations in which the government should intervene to correct the problem. And this brings us to the second fundamental theorem of welfare economics. And essentially, this theorem, which is derived from the first one, explains you that through different redistribution policies, and then letting the market play out in a free way, you can obtain efficient allocations that correct those market failures. So the idea is that you can reach any efficient allocation through this competitive equilibrium process in which people are freely doing their, their decisions, firms and consumers. If before that, you redistribute the original endowments via lump sum transfers. A lump sum transfer is just a economic jargon or economic term to describe a, a, a policy or a, a measure, a political measure, an economic measure in which you take resources from one thing or from one people or from one group, from one firm and move them to other, uh, other groups or other firms or other uh, situations without incurring in any other additional transaction costs. So imagine if this is really similar to like when people decide to donate stuff. Like if you go and uh, you want to help someone out. So uh, let me think. For example, my youngest sister, she works at, a, at an NGO. And uh, there is a, a restaurant that they, herself and the different people that work there really liked uh, near where they worked that just recently closed a couple of weeks ago because of the pandemic. And they are considering uh, doing some form of donation, trying to help out the owners because they really like the restaurant and whatnot. So if they literally took like, I don't know, every one of these people donated for uh, just for the sake of simplicity, a thousand pesos, and literally all of them just gave and transferred that money without any, or without any fee from the bank, just gave that money, like the sum of all that, all that money that they, they gathered to the owners, that would literally be a lump sum transfer because they would have basically given some resources to another group or another person without incurring any additional costs. So if they gave that in cash and they did not have to travel or they did not have to pay any fee, they don't have to pay any tax, they would basically be doing a lump sum transfer. So the government can potentially do lump sum transfers. What happens is that the government tends to charge things taxes, for example. And the bank system tends to charge fees. And different institutions introduce certain transaction costs that basically limit the scope of lump sum transfers. But in theory, if you can give lump sum transfers, you can redistribute resources towards people affected by certain things like inequality, that they were born under poverty, that they did not have the best education or the best opportunities, you could give them those resources and set a more leveled playing field before the market starts doing this thing. You could reach a much better equilibrium in terms of egalitarianism, of being more equal, without having to basically mandate things and just letting people do their own thing in the free market. It's a very theoretical type concept, 
but that justifies basically the idea of introducing appropriate policy measures from the government, introducing redistribution measures, and things that the government may do to try to correct market failures and have a more egalitarian type society and in general, a more egalitarian type economic market. Beautiful.